the great Ron Bennington, oh, everybody. Yeah. See, and, um, I guess I'm playing the part of George tonight. I know. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. I brought the puppet because of the, the live fishbowl audience, but I schlepped them in for nothing. I guess they <laughs> just want to talk to me. But well, okay. it, would, it would be hard to <laughs> unmask a puppet. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, where were you first made? I guess we could go through that. What kind of wood are you made out of? Yeah. Well, you, usually, I when I do radio, I, there's no point in bringing him because there's no visual part of it. But I, I have a problem getting his voice unless I'm holding. It's Is a that weird, right? It's a weird malady that I have. I can't get the voice right. It doesn't come out the same way. Uh, you okay, release the Sinai tablet now. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it really does feel. This room does have the look. Yeah, who of are last these moment. people? These. Jesus. Well, this is the jury, and they're the witnesses yeah. <laughs> to prove that this is not cruel and unusual punishment. Oh. <laughs> um, you were a guy who wanted to do this exactly what you were doing since you were a kid, though, right? I mean, uh, yeah, well, I used to watch Paul Winchell and Jerry Mahoney on TV, sure. and that, that warped my mind. I had, I had to know how these puppets worked. I was very interested in the, um, the mechanics of these things. So I, I bought a dummy at a, a magic store in, in Times Square called Louis Tannins. So I got my first dummy there. It was 350 bucks. It took me a while to save up for it. Uh, before that, I was working with a plastic Jerry Mahoney doll that anybody mm -hmm. could buy. They sell them on the internet now. But uh, but um, that, that's what that's what I, I was fed by uh, comedians and old monster movies as a kid. But the the ventriloquist thing, I, I was I was able. That's what I wanted to do. It. But working with plastic was enough. You you needed wood to do it properly. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the plastic ones just move the mouth. There's, right. Yeah, I, the the wooden ones move the eyebrows and the the yeah. eyes closed and everything like that. So this was like almost an obsession as a yeah, kid. Yeah, completely. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, absolutely. And I was also obsessed with Laurel and Hardy, and and I couldn't find a derby, and I I got a, a men's fedora, and I soaked it in water and put it in a um what do you call it a milk uh, what they used to deliver the milk in a milk box. And I put a frozen fedora on my head. My mother freaked out that I was going to get a pneumonia. <laughs> I don't want to go to the fucking emergency room in the middle of the night. What's wrong with you? I'm Laurel and Hardy. Take that fucking thing off. She was <laughs> unsupportive cunt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, that's the first time that's ever been said on the show. No one's ever said that about their mom. And all, and all the unmasked oh. we've done, you know. Uh, I have a good relationship with it. She's not going to listen. You know, Bob <laughs> Bob Newhart was leaning that way. Really? Then he came back. Wow. But you had to be a, a pretty bizarre kid, I guess. With, I mean, your parents must have been, well, should we just let him run with this? And Well, my father wasn't in the picture. He was a drunken Danish merchant marine. I didn't even know him. He left when I was two. So it was just my mom. Yeah. But I had one uncle. My uncle David, was. Uh, he, he used to talk to me about comedians and turn me on to Benny Hill for for instance, and he took me to see Mad Mad World when it was re-released. Um, so I had one uncle that supported me. He, he used to tell me to go for it. But everybody else in the family was like, uh, you know, fear-based. You know, don't don't try show business. You know, we have right. something to fall back on. Finish high school. Stuff, you know, shit like that. <laughs> All that crazy advice. Yeah. <laughs> we give children practical stuff. <laughs> yeah. it was practical stuff. But I, you know, I was getting paid from the time I was fourteen. I've never mm -hmm. I've never held a day job. Job, so I'm, I, I've achieved what I wanted. It is fascinating that you've never held a day job. And you, I guess, almost at the time that you start working like this and figuring it out, you're like, I'll... I'll do shows. I'm not going to do this at home. You yeah. Know? Well, I started on the, the ferry boats doing mm -hmm. the, the uh, Manha Manhattan to Staten Island trip and do a show there. I wasn't dirty then, so I could perform for anybody. And then I did Central Park and uh, the village was good. You could work till two in the morning in the village. People were bar hopping. Um, the main problem with street performing was getting the first person to stop because you just look like a lunatic <laughs> sitting there. You know, on a <laughs> Yeah. You know, 
<laughs> Seriously, I never yeah. thought of that concept. Yeah. But you have to start performing before the audience gets there. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> like the, ma the magicians that I worked with used to just wave a handkerchief or do some right. hard uh, sleight of hand and they, the crowd would stop. And then the other the problem was getting rid of the crowd because they would want to stay for a show after show. Yeah. That's why I didn't like Washington Square Park. They would stay all day. But usually when you, when you bring the hat out, the cheaper ones would leave immediately. <laughs> and then um, and then anytime the cops chased me, I would get my best collections because I looked pathetic, you know, putting the dummy away, <laughs> the sad kid. So I would make I would make a great collection if the right. cop every time the cop chased me, I'd well, make like a hundred bucks. I'm thinking at the time that you're doing this, you're a kid yeah. and you're working in like the worst crime era of New York City yeah. at the same time. So Yeah, I didn't think about it, but I always had people looking <laughs> looking after me. Yeah. Right. Uh, I was always in busy areas. I knew where you know you don't go on dark streets. I was either in Times Square or you know Central Park. There'd be a lot of people around. You know, yeah. I, I was pretty street smart. And that's well, you got to be street smart to yeah. do to be a street performer. I mean, that's got to be the smartest guy out there because you're looking to also make a buck the whole time. What kind of money were you making as a kid? Um, I was making like a hundred to three hundred a day. I gave most well, of it to my mom because I had no use for cash then. And and the one rule we had was we wouldn't spend any money that was over like an hour old. So if we wanted a meal or go to a movie or something, we would just do a show right in front of the restaurant <laughs> or or in front of the movie theater. It was cool. We wouldn't spend any old money. That is amazing. Yeah. Like, hey, that movie looks good. L let me get George out. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. It felt it felt like I got it for free. Yeah. Just, that's amazing yeah. yeah it was it was awesome I, I, it was good days so you do uh at, so it almost was like at a young age you didn't really value that mo money that much because it just kind of came and went you gave yeah, it away the, the money it was just to be out there every day with my friends i hung around with a lot of magicians i also was friends with philippe petit the guy who walked the twin towers he was a street artist too he used to draw a, a chalk circle on the sidewalk and then he would ride a unicycle around and and juggle bowling pins and the crowd would you know be around the perimeter of the circle and anytime a, a cop would come to chase him he would just jump into the audience and then the cop would break through to the uh, center of the circle and there'd be nobody there and the crowd would just be not ratting him out. It was hysterical. It'd be like a, it's like a just, silent movie. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, he was kind of like a silent movie guy too. Like yeah. uh, that documentary yeah. that they did was just so beautiful on him. Yeah, he's incredible what he did with the, t the Twin Towers stunt. I don't know how he did that. But did you know that was going to even happen before? No, I, I met him after he had yeah. done it. He, he had been arrested and then he had to do a, a free show I think in Grand Central Station or something. He walked, uh, you know, one of the type rope there and then he he turned down a job with ringling brothers and he he liked doing the street shows and for you that was i mean you weren't looking further ahead than street shows you were just like this is great this is what i want to do yeah i knew it would come to an end at some point because the winters you couldn't do anything in the winter except on the ferry boats and the, those people were getting tired of me um <laughs> and then i i went out to california at one point some i was mis misinformed that street performing was encouraged out there and i went out with this magician this black dude who named chris capehart and uh, he got arrested like within an hour of us getting there for <laughs> for uh, what do you call it? panhandling, uh, so I was misinformed. It was in um, um, what do you call it? Um, San Francisco Fisherman Wharf. Right. Wharf is where they like the street acts, not in downtown Los Angeles. So we came back to New York. So I knew that it was going to come to an end. Then you know they went went to the showcase clubs after that like the improv and places like that. But did you think to yourself, I want to be in show business, or did you think I'm already in show business when you were street performing? Um, well, yeah, I mean, back then, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. But, I mean, show business really is uh, is movies and television and mm -hmm. records. Is you know, there's degrees of success. You know, if I if I compare myself to Jim Carrey, I'm a loser. But, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I compare myself to uh, other people that have come and gone and, you know, you know, packed it in and don't do it anymore. I'm successful. It's, it's oh, absolutely. The fact. Well, there's two. <clears throat> there's a few things that I think make you an absolute success. Number one is that you've done it all yourself. You self taught, and you like you said, you'd never walk backwards. The other thing that's different from you than a lot of people that uh, do your craft is that you have 
huge respect and love for you from your peers, and I'm talking about your comedy peers, where yeah. people Com- think that you're just amazing. Oh, you know? well, yeah, co- yeah, comics like me, but they, you know, they don't buy tickets, so who gives a <laughs> shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so much for that. I yeah. mean, shit to you. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's kind of cool, I guess. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually... It's phenomenal because a lot of people who do what you do when they went into the clubs, they were immediately disliked by stand-up comics. Yeah, any prop act was immediately, you know, mm-hmm. you're a boat act, you're a hack or whatever. Uh, any um, prop acts, guitar acts, impressions were looked down, you know, by the Seinfeld type guys. They just think a, a pure monologist right. is, the, is the greatest thing in the world. I, I, I really can't stand stand-up comedians for the most part. I think yeah. they're just lazy and self-centered. Yeah. You know? No one's ever going to fight that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one would possibly disagree. But even when you were out on the streets, you were kind of brushing elbows with some famous people being here in New York, working in the Broadway area. There was a lot of people. Well, who- the greatest was John Lennon. John Lennon um, hung around with me and um, and gave me two bucks and everybody like goes, well, did you save it? It's like, <laughs> I didn't know the guy was going to get killed. He was always there. <laughs> you should have saved the two bucks. <laughs> right, here they are, whatever. <laughs> now, he was he was always in the park, you know, but yeah. that one time he stopped and then later on after he was dead and I read his biography, I felt good that I made him laugh during a, a Troubled time in his life. He was yeah. kind of troubled in, in the mid seventies. I mean, guess he was a heroin or whatnot. But is that one of the things where you're like, okay, John Lennon just stopped by. I'm on the right track. Oh or, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I I thought shit like that was going to happen all the time. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was so cool. He was yeah. really nice. He uh, he said, make sure the dummy gets at least a dollar fifty. <laughs> he, was, he was funny. He was yeah. funny. The Beatles were always funny guys. Well, he yeah. always made sure Ringo got paid. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. But it is an, uh, that to me that uh, time that you were doing that is it was one of the most amazing times in New York because at one point the city was in real trouble. Yeah, and at other point people like John Lennon were walking around and there was great art being made. You know, there was a great energy. Yeah, I mean, there. I didn't think of the, the city as being really dangerous. I mean, it was dangerous, but it, I just figured, it, you know, I, I didn't know it was going to get better, so I had nothing to compare it to. You, <laughs> right, just, knew, you just knew, you know, to avoid certain neighborhoods, yeah. you know? Like most in those days. <laughs> yeah. Most places you didn't go. Yeah, very true. <laughs> um, but... Um, I always had a milk crate. If somebody fucked me, I could always smash him in the face with the milk crate. You know, I needed that to put my foot on. Did Did you ever have any of those kind of troubles where somebody tried to steal your hat or? Yeah, I George? got sta- George was stabbed in Central Park. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. But, I didn't read about that in the paper, but yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. Now, who stabbed them? A Puerto Rican. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's kind of it's a yeah. cliche, but yeah. Every everyone enjoyed that moment before we edited it out. <laughs> okay. So he you're... was of Hispanic descent. <laughs> oh, that's. I know because descent was coming in my direction. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have a scar. I still yeah. have the scar here from that. He sli- I was holding onto the head stick, George's head stick, yeah. and he cut me here, so I was bleeding after that. And everybody thought it was a great story and a good compliment. Yeah. Oh, it's a compliment. <laughs> they stabbed the puppet, you know. <laughs> Did he realize that George? I was think a he was puppet? on. Uh, he must have been on angel dust or some right. heavy drug because he had a weird look in his eyes. His pupils were gigantic, and he was fixated on the doll, and he wasn't looking at me. <laughs> and he was like doing one of these and just getting all amped up, <laughs> and then it just jumped out and said "El Diablo" and stuck him <laughs> and ran into the crowd. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Well, I, you know, it is true that that whole thing comes from an old spiritual thing that ventriloquism. Yeah, it was like supposed to be bringing back the dead and stuff. Like when they first started doing. Is it. that right? I didn't yeah. know that part. But it is because there's a creep factor to it from the Twilight Zone and all right. those mo- movies like Magic. You know, there's a subtext that people are scared of those things. Yeah. You know? At a certain point, does it start to hurt your feelings that if you're watching a movie? or uh, any kind of TV show that, that they bring that in 
that's the murderer you the guy that you would be playing no I like that it makes people like <laughs> it makes people leave you alone and kind of you know get out of your way a little bit right. yeah I like that, that that part of it I like the dummy to be not too fluffy and, and cute and stuff you know my, my, my doll is pretty scary people don't want to be alone in a room with them that, did you feel that way at all when you were a kid? Like when was you I wa- scared of him? Yeah, no, because I knew how it worked. I knew it was just a prop. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have that. I mean, I have a lot of mental illness, but I don't have the schizophrenia part. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's never been anything of why did George say that? God damn it. Um. No. No. I guess there are moments when something comes out that I do, that didn't go through my brain first it just came out of my mouth because there are times that I've seen you and I thought oh poor Otto I don't know why he has to put up with this asshole sometimes oh yeah he's really ruining it for both of them and I swear I felt like I don't, I, when you did, when you did Letterman I'm like why is he picking on Dave why oh. why because I knew I wasn't going to be a regular on the show and I figured you know I, I, I've been watching the show for years and just going out ah, he's a douche you know I just wanted to say it out loud once you know and plus I felt like the whole ventriloquist week was kind of of, kind of insulting. I mean, it was nice to put, you know, give uh, uh, what uh, people in my profession a shot, but he was doing it kind of in an insulting way in mm-hmm. his own, you know what I mean, his own, his own smug way. And we know from what you've said, you think just the best out of stand-ups. Now, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you didn't get to meet him, you know, it was yeah. like, you know, you just, you're hustled into a, a dress room, then you're brought down, you do, you tape it, and then you're, you're, you're brought back out. You know, he doesn't speak to you as a, like a, a fellow comic, you know. Right, he doesn't feel... Yeah. Yeah, well, he's kind of mysterious, don't you think? Dave? Yeah, I guess so. But I heard Jay Leno's like, he talks to you as an equal and you just, you know, it's going to be fun and whatnot. You right. Know? It would be nice to hear that from the star of the show. You know, I'm a nervous wreck before doing that. You are, know? You re- are you well, really? Are you really? Letterman, I was nervous, sure. Yeah. You know, but all these years you've been performing since you were a kid, I think it would be. Well, a, a, I had it work clean, and B, even though it's taped, it's still whatever they get on tape is what they're going to air. And if I mm-hmm. bomb or I suck or I forget a joke, that's what they're going to show. You know, it's you know, it's it's tape, but it's still whatever they get. When did you decide? Because. You know, everybody had kind of worked clean, I think, before you. Yeah. That would did that did your kind of stuff. So when did you say I'm going to go in a different direction with this? It was mostly to get the comics to put me on early. You know, because they otherwise they didn't they had no interest in seeing a, a clean act. You know. Right. Plus, I wasn't a kid anymore. You know, and the novelty of being a cute kid with a dummy was wearing off, and I had to start you know competing with the big boys and stuff. You know, and, and you know they were putting me on too late, and I wanted the comics. You know, if I said something really shocking, then the comics would be like, "Oh, we got to put this." guy on he's nuts I went you got to hear him you know and word spread like that did you did you feel it the first time that you went in that direction was it planned or were you improvising on stage where you decided you know Jordan no I went home and thought about it yeah. how, to, how to get the comics to like me because they I, they weren't welcoming into me into their clique at mm-hmm. that point you know so who were some of the guys that you were breaking in with you broke in with some pretty terrific people um, well, George Wallace, I worked with him a lot yeah. back then. Um, Rita Rudner was around a lot. I mean, Seinfeld and Larry David were around, but they were at Catch, and I was performing downtown at a club called Good Times mm-hmm. on 3rd and 31st. I felt more comfortable there, and I was always intimidated by Catch. I was a little scared to go on there. It w- again, there's another time that you were around where there was just remarkable stuff oh, happening yeah. all around. Uh, great acts were happening in those days. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was great. Uh, but you know, it was I, w- I was going from making hundreds of dollars to like fifteen bucks for a set on yeah. a Saturday. So financially, it sucked in the beginning. But then I started working and I started opening for a lot of bands at the bottom line. I opened for a million great acts there: um, Madonna, David Johansson, Flo and Eddie, Cheap Trick. And I was opening for all these people. It was great. Now, how come? How would that? Would Madonna say? I want this uh, to be my opening. No, then no, I would never even dawn on me. No, they if I just was they, no. They 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 didn't request me or nothing like that. They just stuck me on there okay, so to eat you, up some time. You were with, with the bottom line people. Yeah. Now at the time, did you say, "Hey, look at some of these acts I'm working with," or was it just a gig? 
and you were in and out of? Um, no, I wasn't too impressed with any of Well, Flo and Eddie I was impressed with because they horsed around with me. They hung around my dressing room. Right. You know, they had the big dressing room and I had the little shitty one. And then they had like 50 people in their dressing room and they just snuck out to come and hang with me in my dressing room. And they, they were making me laugh. They were really cool guys. Very nice to me. Well, it's yeah, they are, they are actually are very funny. But from yeah. like, uh, hey, don't you wish you could hook on to them? You should have probably been nicer to Madonna than yeah. uh, <laughs> it was Flo right. and Eddie. I mean, one's going in one direction, the other it's going yeah. the other. Like, uh, fuck you, Madonna. I'm hanging out with Flo and Eddie. Yeah, it's it's, it's true. She was um, on the verge of becoming an right. international star. It was right before that all happened to her. She was just a smelly little East Village girl to me. You know, <laughs> yeah. By the way, I think that's the name of her biography. It's uh, <laughs> Smelly Little East Village Girl. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so you were making less money by actually breaking into kind of legitimate. Yeah, I mean, where do you go from you can't street perform forever? It seems like a sad, you know, life after a while, you know, uh -huh. just being out there, you know, in, in the, you know, the, the street trail or whatever you call it. But could you do it again? Could you just walk out of here right now and go out and just pick up money just doing this? It think? seems like New York is just noisier and more crowded now. It doesn't seem possible to me. It seems, you know, I think about that a lot when I'm on Fifth Avenue or like, you know, uh, 45th and Broadway was another great corner for me. Um, that's where I met Peter Falk. Peter Falk shilled for me for an hour. He hung out. That's amazing. Yeah, that just... he, yeah he kept, he, all right, start the show over again. That was terrific. <laughs> this is really working out. And then he kept, you know, he put a dollar in and go, come on, you cheap asses. This kid's working on, you know. This is, and then uh, he gave me 50 bucks at the end of like an hour and a half. He told me I, got, I had a lot of guts. That was awesome. And he's he just a guy walking by, sees this. Yeah, he, probably... had, he had some time to kill before he was meeting some agent or something like uh -huh. that. Yeah, he, he stayed with me a long time. He stayed through like five or six shows. He was great. Wow. It was just like meeting Columbo. He was exactly the, exactly the same. Yeah, it was amazing. He was so cool. I think that those, you know, those kind of stories are just phenomenal, though. Like, I mean, who yeah. else is going to have those kind of... Experiences, yeah, but it's first-hand John Lennon story is yeah, you know, right. chopped liver, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know the fact is, like, you can't plan on any of those. No, things I know. Happening. And being a kid, I didn't get a fucking picture. That really pisses me off. That I didn't snap a shot with John Lennon. Boy, does that suck. I still get upset when I think about that. You, you really look on the bright side of things, don't <laughs> yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> I know you can't unscramble eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look back over this you really plan nothing along the way are there things plan. that you yeah are there things that you wish you would have done differently or are you kind of happy the way yeah I kind of wish I had gone to California maybe when it was like 16 or 17 and just yeah. tried it out there the comedy store but I don't think anybody really got discovered in those clubs mm -hmm. other than um uh, like Freddie Prince got literally picked out of the catch and put on TV. Uh, you know, I don't know what's what's the point in hanging around those clubs too long. You got to get get on the road. Well, did you enjoy the road? Was did the road work for you? Yeah, the, I'm still on the road doing mm -hmm. those gigs. It's great. I don't mind that at all. I love it. Uh, when when did you make the move from? All right, you're on the street, then you're doing New York clubs, and then. Uh, getting on the road. The comedy boom in the 80s was just, it just happened and everybody was working. Anybody who had a decent half hour was working like six, seven nights a week. You know, if you went to the improv and just sat at the bar, you'd wind up going to a gig. Somebody would cancel or be late and, and they would just, you'd be in a car on the way to a gig. It was, the uh, the work was plentiful then. Plentiful. It was, it was amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so also it felt like you were in one of those things where this, where, riding another wave and it's going to go on like this for a long time yeah there weren't as many comics then everybody had a good act then there's just so many awful people now doing it badly <laughs> you know and then and they then they put these guys on tv so then you know then somebody in a you know some farmer goes i'm funnier than that fucking guy he jumps on a bus and now you got another wave of less funny people trying to you know take take over the comedy thing it's just right. getting worse and worse so the level of comedy yeah know. one of the big problems for you is farmers getting on buses <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and saying, yeah let me be in, in yeah. this. when is enough how many Stand-ups do we need? You yeah, know? Jesus Christ. 
But, at, you know, I mean, yeah, I guess they're following the, kind of the same path that you followed, right? As they're trying to kid. win the lottery. They know they know these sitcom guys make millions of dollars and they're trying to get that big you know, thing. But how many of these people would have been performers if they were born before television and radio right. and, and the comedy clubs and strip malls? Would they still have been performers or are they just trying to, you know, find a lazy uh, way to make a living just by, you know, yapping? See, that's the thing about your profession is it goes back even before stand-up comedy. Yeah, you know, I it's believe been so. Around. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess they use it for black magic, you said. I, I never well, read it, that. Uh, well, it, what it, it was <laughs> not even black magic, but it was like a form of spirituality where and then later they burned all these people. They, but, yeah. um, oh, good. <laughs> but they would say anybody who could do that it was like they were bringing in and you, you would pay them like you would a spiritualist. Oh, you mean like a seance? Yeah, it's like a seance. 50 bucks to talk to a yeah. dead relative. It, it, it was if fucking If you want to talk work. to him while I drink yeah. a glass of water at <laughs> <Yeah>. 75. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It's basic, It was basically carny work. Yeah. There's no doubt about That's it. That's interesting, But yeah. then even like the vaudeville stuff was, you know, you had to have a real act. You know, you had to be able to do something physical, not just stand there and talk. Yeah, I, I should have been born back in those times. I think I would have been friends with the Marx Brothers and Fields and those people, you know. Those are the people you most relate to. The, yeah, the golden age of comedy is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I can't get enough of that shit. It is, um, you do seem like a man out of time. There's no doubt about yeah, it. Like for your, sure. <laughs> your entire act. And I mean, I'm going to want to get into a little uh, later with uh, the pig row stuff. If you guys have seen the show, it does not feel like a modern <laughs> show yeah. at all, so, except for that you curse. Yeah, we, yeah. it looks like that, uh, what do you call it, in, in uh, Casino with De Niro has that <laughs> shitty show in Vegas. <laughs> right. We tried to, you know, with the dancers, the Vegas showgirls. Yeah, we tried to give it that tack. What, what, what gave you that idea that I went ahead in that direction of... Doing a show on the internet? Yeah, doing a show on the internet, but you're still, you make it look like the early days of TV, whether you set out to do that or not. I, I think there's just some kind of energy around you oh, that you're a guy out Maybe. Of the creator of the show, Bobby Capelli, came up with the entire idea of the show, so I had nothing to do with that mm -hmm. other than being the, 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 the central character on there. Um, just on the internet, you could just shoot it and put it up there you don't have to get approval from a network to do it you know it just makes sense so maybe it, maybe I'm getting in on the birth of a new medium you know but yeah and, and as as you're doing the birth of a new medium you brought back the old one Variety which was kind of the stuff that you loved when you were a little kid right um, yeah yeah like where anything could happen like the Dean Martin show where people yeah. just walk in the door hey look who it is it's John Wayne and shit right. like that you know it's great I love that. And you've also been able to get some big names to come in and do the show. Every, every big time comic that I asked said yes, except um, Nick Nick DiPaolo. But I think it was the way I, I asked him. I, I had a third party call him. I think if I had called him directly, he wouldn't have said no. You know, mm -hmm. he would have been. Uh, he would have felt bad to say no to me. But everybody else said yes. And you you called them directly. Who are some of the people that you've used? Louis Black, Jim Norton, Martling, Jim Florentine. They all said yes immediately. You know, they just said, "Just tell me when." It was great. I thought. I think that the the whole idea of it is so funny. And again, it's something that kind of looks new, but at the same time, couldn't be more familiar. It's like I think there's something about variety shows that are in our DNA. Almost it's like, how do we keep doing something different? Exactly, a variety you know? show. I had a ba we had everything the Tonight Show had except a good desk. You know, we had a band. <laughs> I had I had uh, Big A, who's here, was my co-host. Uh, Big, Big A's here. No. yeah. <clears throat> what what gave you the idea of putting Big A? Um, on well, the show. yeah, as a, my, as a co-host, a guy who doesn't yeah. say anything, and then when he speaks, he stutters. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I just thought he, he worked out. He showed up one day, and we just threw him on the couch, and he was just good. He's just good. He, he relaxes people. Does he really relax yeah. people? Because <laughs> I don't know. If I sat next to him in the bus, I yeah. don't know <laughs> how relaxed I would feel. Yeah. 
He's a big wet sponge in the summer too. When you squeeze him, you get. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, <laughs> not gonna, I'm not going to squeeze Big A at all. But that, well, that could be one of the new bits that you do. Have people come in and squeeze Big A. <laughs> now the guests when they come in to do the pig roast, do they know what you have planned for them, or you um, know? <clears throat> well, because we weren't paying anybody, we tried to get them in and out as quickly as possible, and then gave them the option if they want to hang out, they're welcome to. But we, I wanted word to get out that you're in and out. The in, we interview you, and then we shoot the closing credits where everybody's milling around on stage, like Saturday Night Live. You know, at the right. end, the end credit thing. So we 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 did that. Uh, on purpose to get people in and out so it would be painless, you know? Uh, and so first season is done, right? Yeah, yeah. We wound up doing about 15 shows of it. Now we're, we're trying to do a second season. I want to do it in Vegas. There's, you know, there's so many, so much talent to pull from out there, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I feel like I, I've pretty much used up everybody in the New York area that I know anyway, right. you know? I, I, I was ninety percent of the acts came through me. They they you know they brought a couple of those oddballs like the fire eaters and stuff. Right. But I got all the the big time comics to come on. But you feel comfortable uh, around the fire eaters as well. That kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. The carny. Yeah. Yeah. I know. The, the carny yeah. stuff for you Love works. That shit. Yeah. Uh, which again is uh, Penn and Teller, of course, huge fans of yours, and they're the same way. They love that. Same era that you're crazy about. Yeah, they, they like they like me, but Penn, Penn I find very hard to talk to. I, every time I try, like uh, like he, he was talking about how he couldn't stand Peter Sellers, and I was like, really? Can you explain that to me? You didn't like, you know? I mean, uh, the Pink Panther was seen in every country, so everybody in the world is wrong, and you're right. <laughs> he goes, uh, I go, what about Doctor Strange? Like, no, nah, I didn't like it. The book was right, right, right. It's like just one of those guys where everything he says is like the truth, and you know, he's big and. and Opinionated, you know what I mean? He's like, yeah, nobody, everybody's afraid to have an opinion around him because he's a famous guy or whatever. Uh -huh. You know, I, I was trying to argue with him, you know, sticking up. I felt good I stuck up for Peter Sellers, you know. Sure. Yeah. Because Peter Sellers can do your career so good right now. Uh, yeah, I, I, and, it's true, it's true. And you like can't. Yeah. Is <laughs> <laughs> good point. I am st I'm stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a bridge that you wouldn't burn? Do you, do you enjoy like, hey, here's this bridge burning. I'm on the wrong side of it. No, nah, <laughs> nah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think of it as burning a bridge. Because I, was, I can tell you that yeah. he only speaks very well of you. Yeah. Uh, uh, he thinks you're well, terrific. Well, well, when I see him in Vegas, you you brought backstage to the dressing room. I mean, they treat me great. They get me free seats. And then you're brought to the dressing room. And then, like, they don't talk to you. You know, and, and, I, and I'm, I was getting nervous. I go... You know, I was trying to keep the conversation going, and uh, and nothing. They're just they're eating. They have like they're sitting there with these dead eyes, and they're eating their after show <laughs> snack. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to talk. And all right, are we done here? Why the <laughs> fuck am I here? You know, am I not as famous as them? So they're not going to engage me? You know, in you know, in a conversation. I. Right. All this paranoia kicked in. You do, yeah. you do run some of that where yeah. it's very important for you to think that everybody's on the same level right no There's I just I don't know I mean it just seemed like you know wh why why make sure I'm brought backstage if you're not going to talk to me you mm -hmm. know I didn't ask to come back I've already met them I know them both but they you know the girl after the show was over came over to me and said you're auto okay follow me come back to the they call it the monkey room that's their dressing room and whatnot mm -hmm. and then they didn't fucking talk to me <laughs> it was weird <laughs> Letterman didn't talk enough yeah. to you <laughs> Penn and Teller don't talk enough yeah. to you uh, I'm sure you got some Obama opinions because he hasn't I've called you like I mean, I, 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 I but you would expect him to be wide open, um, <laughs> like John no. Lennon was. Why would he care what I think? I'm a harmless puppeteer. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wrong to want a conversation when I'm in, you know? Well, I don't, I wasn't there for it, but I thought maybe they just did their show, they were exhausted, they were having a little something to eat. You know, a lot of times when performers are talking a lot, as soon as they're done, the, the I kind of energy that. drops. Then, then why bring me backstage? You know, why just mm -hmm. say they're, they're going home, they're, they're tired tonight or something, you right. know? I mean, if somebody's in my dressing room, I feel obliged to keep it, you know, keep the conversation going. Keep it going. Something. Yeah. What, are you going to sit there in dead silence? and not say anything it's weird I know I'm an odd person but that that just seemed weird now um, you uh, have worked with all kinds of people coming up too I mean just about everybody that's 
come through New York you've worked with at one time or another. Um, yeah, I used to work with Eddie Murphy uh, back in right before Saturday Night Live. He was cool. We used to meet in um, uh, Flushing, Queens on 71st and Continental, uh-huh. and we'd meet there and take the bus to a club called the Rainy Night House mm. in, in, I think it was Kew Gardens, Queens. And then uh, when we would drive to a gig, Eddie's thing was he would always fall asleep when we got to a toll, so he wouldn't have to, like, <laughs> chip in money. Sure. But he would, he would do it funny. He would, like, <laughs> snore loudly with his yeah. head back. But then, and then he used to say, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 21. He would say it every time I was with him, mm-hmm. you know, before they even had that positive you know, thought shit. Right. But he, but he, Positive but he, thought shit. Yeah. But he did. He, he, yeah. he, he did pull it off. He was a millionaire by the time he was 21. And I remember that. He would always say it. And, and then he would spend a lot of time working on his hair in the car. He would do that pat, picking and patting thing. And yeah. He did a lot of that. Yeah. W- what did you do to ruin that relationship? <laughs> <How did> you- <laughs> no. no. Uh, Eddie, you're never going to make it and you're dog shit. I'll if, see you later. If Eddie saw me now, he'd yeah. remember me. Oh, um, I'm sure. Uh, no, nothing. He just, he went on to movies and I was doing fucking ground rounds for 75 <laughs> bucks in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you consider like your class of guys that you came up with that like the, like everybody that normally breaks in the comedy, there's certain guys that they kind of start it with that they feel like you know um a couple of them uh, are no longer here my friend bob woods who I, I think is one of the funniest people did you know uh, woods yeah i knew woods from when he came down into florida yeah he was amazing well there was he was a great impressionist yeah and there's just jet white kind of hair yeah kind of looked like a uh, a bigger it, captain kangaroo yeah exactly it was like knowing gleason he was like our gleason yeah he He's was he guy. did have yeah. a real great gleason thing yeah and here was the great thing about him and he should be one of the guys that's remembered yeah whenever <laughs> there was comedians that would come into a club they would find out that there was no open bar because Bobby Woods was there the week yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> he would That's drain true. him. That's true. He would. He was one of the the finest drinkers. Oh my God! You'd ever want to meet. Away. You had to make a will out if you were going out drinking. <laughs> with him. Yeah, serious lush. He was funny though. And that was one of the guys that you uh, started with. Oh, and, did a billion gigs with Woods. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we were both the closing acts, so we weren't a lot of times on the same bill. But we would meet after the show at my friend uh, Chips Cooney. Well, he was Don Ippolito then. Now mm. he's known as Chips Cooney. And his house was like party central. After the gig, we'd all meet up there. So the fun was after the show stuff, right. the, dr- the ride back. It was never about the gig. You know, The gig it, would be the last thing we talked about. So it was never about the performance, but yeah. now the show's over, we have money. Let's well, party. Exactly. It was the eighties. <laughs> everybody everybody had a sack of Coke on him and everybody was partying around the clock, you yeah. know. And you enjoyed that as much as anybody else. Yeah. Too? Yeah. Yeah, too much. Now at at what point do you find out? Because we all do find out that's too much. Did it start to take a toll on you? Or yeah, I mean, when you when you start buying it for, by yourself and didn't just do it when somebody had some, then, right. then it gradually becomes a problem. And then when you're doing it alone, that's a, that's a, then the problem is escalating, you know. And then canceling a gig here and there because you're hungover or stuff like that. Right. That's that's when it's a problem. When you know when when you when you choose that over your over your your show, you it know? becomes a it becomes a very dark dark yeah. place. Um, and you're right. By the time you're locking that second door, where you got the front door locked, then the bedroom door yeah, locked. Yeah, exactly. Spider just, Man's <laughs> out there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Then it's just you and the package. You're like, ah, uh, <laughs> what happened to the party? Yeah. Yeah. Because well, like you, you start to get together with your friends, and then later, like, you know, when you know it's bad, they're like, you have any coke? Nope. No, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I'm leaving now. Yeah. Going into the bathroom. Pot's the only drug I, I don't regret ever doing. That never hurt me at mm-hmm. all. Pot was never a problem. It was, you know, alcohol and coke. That those were the, those are more um, harmful. And you're away from both of those now. You no, I still drink. I just you still don't drink. Do the blow. Yeah. Uh, but you, but you do think it's a problem, even though you, you keep going with it. For me, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. It yeah. would send me right back to the shitter if I if I did it again. Yeah. Right. But what about alcohol? You can. Do I consider that a problem? No, no. not at all. I can yeah. take it or leave it. So you with coke? How did you finally say? All right, I'm going to pull away from this because not many people, you know. Um, my, I, I had a friend who um, committed suicide, my friend Seth, who owned Pip's Comedy Club. Um, 
and my dog died and this all happened within like weeks of each other and I was like um, I said I'm, I'm gonna be dead if I don't stop this I because I was just too many things were happening and I I, I I felt like I had nothing to to come home to my dog was was gone my you know it was just th- th- that's what did it for me mm-hmm. yeah and that was it. it was like cold turkey from that point on yeah no help no outside help I, no. I went to I went to a few meetings, but I I was out of my league. These people like I shot my grandmother for a, a <laughs> rock of coke, you know. Right. And, you know I'm you know I'm, I'm gonna rape somebody after this meeting. Was, <laughs> I go, these people are really like drugs, you know. By the, by the way, I, I didn't have any stories yeah. as good as theirs, you know. By the way, thanks for keeping their story synonymous, still. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I'm not going to name names. Yeah. But so you just felt like, and I, I mean, because you were doing it for a long time, yeah. right? And, but you were able to pull back. Yeah. It's an amazing thing, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of times I tried it after that, but it was a different feeling. My body, like, rejected it. It didn't, yeah. it didn't work anymore. Yeah, you really don't run into a lot of people who are uh, like senior citizens going, oh, still enjoying Coke, really? Uh, yeah. It's the love and crack working out for me. Yeah, yeah, it's diminished returns. It's, it's not yeah, it fun is. after a while. It just becomes a problem and an expense and horrible. It's um, not fun. And it's, it's almost the exact opposite of what you want to give to an audience, right? I mean, you do, you play it a little bit cynical, but I know you like to get laughs and you like to make people happy yeah you never know when you're giving your last performance you know what i mean you you know you could be shot in the face you know on the way to the car so you know try and give a good show so people talk nicely about you when you're gone you know i know i surely will i'm only i'm only going to say good things to you after but you there is this dark thing that you go back to of like I asked you if you like to make people laugh and you're like yeah because one day I'll get shot in the face and this will all be gone. Well, you, uh-huh. th- there's a there's a cynical thing there, but it's weird with you because it's like cynical and sweet at the same time, which I guess is your act if you really think. Well, about I'm it. trying to just you know distract myself and not think about death every moment of the day, but it's always there. For it's all looming of us. for you. Yeah, for all of us. Yeah, you know. Why, what have you heard? What, uh, <laughs> this is a little sooner. When, when did you start to, did you always think about death this much? Is it, uh, yeah, when I heard that Laurel and Hardy were dead as a kid and I would never get to meet them, I was pretty upset about that, you know. And that was the, that day for you, that was the worst day. Um, From that point on, you're like, if Laurel and Hardy can die, anyone can. I don't think I thought about it then. I don't know. Um, I, I guess, you know, it's not something that comes up that much. I guess I'm just saying it to just say something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know from you and Penn and Teller, you don't like dead air. But, yeah. um, <laughs> and just like whatever you think about Penn, you know, Teller doesn't speak, so you can't blame no, him. No, I had a good conversation <laughs> with him. He talks a lot. He was cool. Was your sh- hand up his back? No, no, no. I <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that. I know he's a very interesting guy. Yeah, he's very. Oh, and then a friend of mine had told me that his family goes back to like the Revolutionary War because he, mm-hmm. he's from Philadelphia, and my friend was from Philadelphia. And then I said to I said to um, tell her, I go, this buddy of mine said that your family was like in the Revolutionary War. He goes, it's complete bullshit. He made it up. Whoever said that? <laughs> I went, oh god, my friend's a liar because he said it with such conviction right and then i said i said because i can see you in a powdered wig you know and he kind of giggled at that right you know because i just, it just made sense he just something about sure. that story seemed authentic and then i had to go back to my friend and go why would you tell me something that's complete bullshit i embarrassed myself i flew three thousand miles to go no it's not at all true now i'm a jerk off and what, did you fi- find out why your friend just made it up out of nowhere who the fuck knows because <laughs> he he knows that i know pen and teller and i I think he wanted to impress me that he knew something about them that I sure. didn't know. My idiot friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and who are some of the other folks uh, that you've worked with on, on the road over the years? Um, I know you've done it no, with... Just, uh, Adam Sandler. I did a bunch of gigs no, with him. Is this before Adam uh, oh, yeah, took off as well? Saturday Night Live, yeah. 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 Um, 
There's not, he, there's not really a great story about Adam. I have a great John Belushi story. Sure, I love to hear it. Um, I'm I, a big fan of his. Were you as well of Belushi? Uh, Belushi? Yeah. He's all right. I, yeah. I like the Blues Brothers. Um, right. Well, he was in it. Yeah. <laughs> he was. He was in it all right. Um, there was a club called the UK Club, which was an after-hours club down on th- um, 13th and like First, a- I think 3rd Avenue. So uh, my friend was the bouncer there. His name was Rockets Red Glare. He was an actor, too. <laughs> He was in. Oh um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Was in, in Basquiat too? He as was well? in the movie Talk Radio with yeah. Eric Bogosian. He's yeah. the guy who kills Bogosian. He's a real creepy looking guy. And uh, Belushi was there that night, and he was making a lot of trouble. He kept going into the DJ booth and taking the record off, and he had this one record that he wanted to play over and over. And then Rockets go- comes over to me and he gives me money. He goes, "Get him the fuck out of here! <laughs> Take him up to catch! Get him the fuck out of here!" And Belushi was with this really hot chick that he was ignoring. So we we, got, we hailed a checker cab, and I sat in the front of the car, and the girl was in between me and the driver, and Belushi sprawled out on the back of the floor of the checker cab all the way all the way uptown, and he was singing um, Johnny Be Good and drinking out of a bottle of Jack Daniels and, and fucking ignored this girl the entire night. And then we got up to catch, and he went down into the basement and put out a big pile of coke, and he was sitting there on a stool under a light, a light bulb in a filthy basement basement with this pile of coke and then the comics would go down and just say hey john what's up and do a line and then uh and then he just say he stayed there uh, like at the end of the night i closed up with the bartender and he was still sitting there sweating and staring at this pile of coke it was like but I, I said this is going to be my Belushi story. I was like, I'm going to remember everything that happened because I, mm-hmm. I knew I'd probably never see him again alive anyway. So that, that was kind of sad seeing him sitting there with that. How, how long was that before he passed he, oh, away? Oh, he had already um, before he died. Yeah, well, he'd already done a couple of movies, so right. it was probably a year or two before. Yeah. So he was a mess. Um, I uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't believe the number of people that you've bumped into in your life, and all of it strange. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. There's never, there's never just like a normal story. All yeah. these stories are insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another time when I was street performing, um, every time um, Yul Brenner was doing uh, King and I uh, at the <laughs> yeah what uh, <laughs> okay at the at the Minskoff Theater on 40, 46th and Broadway, he was doing a revival of the King and I. And then I'd be in the middle of a show, and a limo would pull up, and fucking Westworld would jump out and bust up my <laughs> bust up my audience. You know, everybody right. go, oh fuck, it's uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. the guy from the Magnificent Seven, holy shit, and ruin my fucking show. And then one time he caught me between shows, and I was just counting my change, and and he came over to me, and he was he was like, yeah, I'm sorry, I busted up your tip. <laughs> Would you like to come to a rehearsal? So I I got to see him rehearse at the King and I, but yeah. I didn't, I only knew him from Westworld. I I love. That yeah, he did a few other movies besides yeah. that as yeah. well. <laughs> um, but these are crazy stories. Have you ever thought about writing them down, or is that? Not yeah, I'm you? definitely gonna you know write my my uh, story in a bunch of chapters. I have, I have I think I have some good stories. Yeah, you've yeah. got some good fucking stories. <laughs> <laughs> you've got some crazy ass stories. Yeah. You definitely do. Yeah, I mean, you think I can get a publisher? Yeah. Really? Why couldn't you get a publisher? I don't know. I always think I'm not famous enough. I, I guess, I mean, if I shoot the president, I'll be more famous, right? Don't even say that. I mean, <laughs> don't even say that at all. I don't want to be on CNN later going, oh, okay. I don't know. He told me all these crazy stories. I should have figured he was going to do something no, weird. No, no, <laughs> no. No, no. No, no. No, I, I definitely think that your story n- needs to be told, particularly since, like I said, very few people do what you do in the way that you do it, and you're completely self-taught. Well, Am a lot right? of times, um, yeah. Well, a lot of times when I when I do these radio shows, they're always trying to uh, uh, egg me on to say something bad about Jeff Dunham, who's uh, the obvious um, big guy in my field. And uh, I think he's great. You know, he doesn't do what I do, but he doesn't have one definable character like I right. do. He has like a whole. He's more of like a like a Jim Henson. He's got all these characters. You know. Yeah, you know what? I, if I was to be totally honest, I wouldn't be comparing with what you do to other people do because I do think it's absolutely unique. And I think the thing is, it's not even about jokes, but when you and George are together, it's hard not to see two people. And I know that's almost ridiculous to say, uh, but 
the personalities go in such different places um, that it's it's beyond what I think of as jokes. Oh, thanks. Well, all in the family was a big influence on me. Um, the the dynamic between Rob Reiner and and um, Carol O'Connor. I I'm I'm the Rob Reiner half, and George is the you know racist, sexist, mm-hmm. you know homophobic, angry, you know doll you know yeah <laughs> but I, you know but I, if there isn't somebody you know fighting for the cause of good then he's just an evil character up there alone you know yeah it would be kind of interesting you yeah. should just both do the same line <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> just yeah you're right man well, that, that would, that <laughs> fucking would, women that would be a small <laughs> clan meeting yeah <laughs> but yeah I mean I always think that one of the things about the, uh, this is like sometimes when uh, Otto gets into it your face is just like so pained like oh dude you know well, that it just I, slays me because I attack the audience a lot so I figure if, the, if, if I'm attacked as much as them then right. it doesn't look like I'm victimizing a customer in the audience but during one of my slumps I wasn't talking a lot as myself and it would just be George doing like a monologue <laughs> and I met Al Lewis Grandpa Munster sure. told me he goes he goes, you, he goes there's no you up on stage why are you even there he goes without conflict there's no comedy and I said what do you mean by that he goes well you, why are you up there you're not talking at all it's just a pop- it. So that that reminded me of what the act used to be. I was in a, I guess I was in a bad rut. I was just phoning it in, you know. That which can happen yeah. when you get an act that works. It's Definitely, like, yeah, yeah. I was phoning it in. But when a guy like Grandpa Munster, who's done everything in show business, tells tells you something, you listen. I respect him. You know, it's not just some guy. You know, yeah, it's Grandpa Munster. So I listen to that. You know? Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> who's not going to listen to yeah. the grandfather on, of the Munsters? Listen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a cape. Well, yeah. he used to have a comedy comedy club. Yeah, studio. yeah, yeah. He did. He was a big dude. He yeah, very tall. That fucking Fred Gwynn must have been a huge guy. His, <laughs> his grandpa was gigantic. He was very tall. Right. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Fred Gwynn was twelve and a half feet tall. He was. No one. Yeah. <laughs> Frighteningly tall. Oh my god. Well, you know, Fred Gwynn also wore the shoes. Yeah. Just so you know. He mem- spent more time in the Frankenstein makeup than Karloff or anybody else that ever played the monster. Is that right? Yeah. And you love the old monster stuff. You love all that. Yeah, I do. What about yeah. the? Do you like any of the new stuff, like with CGI or? Well, I don't like when zombies move real fast. I think that <laughs> in the zombie world, when a zombie is chasing you, they can't outrun you, but there's just so many of them, and they're eventually they're going to chew through the wall or scratch through the, the fucking wall and get to you. Right. But now the zombies move, like, really fast. I don't, I don't understand that, you know? Dude, this is a chapter in the book. Yeah. This is, it is the <laughs> stuff people need to hear. Yeah, we're almost in zombie weather, too. <laughs> Wait, uh, that, I got to stop for yeah, a second okay. and try to figure out what zombie weather is. Yeah. Um, there is zombie weather? Well, Halloween, you know. Oh, Halloween, yeah. okay. <laughs> no, because I was thinking, is it fog? <laughs> is it mist? Yeah. You love Halloween? Yeah. 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 See, that's weird because in a lot of ways, to even think about that, you, are, you know, what you do is, I guess, like keeping that eternal thing going what know? eternal thing well the, the it's always Halloween there's still a connection of childhood because you've got that thing you've managed to turn it into a, a living well I was in Vegas um, just about a month ago and, Co- and David Copperfield I'm name dropping shamelessly here I'm <laughs> no you know what um, but he's got this museum out in the Nevada desert where, where he has all the magic and all the ventriloquist stuff and he's got one of my Georges there and uh, which is an honor but it was kind of creepy because I was the only guy in there that was still alive and breathing because he had <laughs> he had uh, Charlie McCarthy and Howdy Doody and all these dead motherfuckers and, and, and I was there you know when my dummies in the middle of the desert right yeah um, I lost my train of thought um what were we talking about? Well, Fuck. we were uh, basically off. talking about kids um, still being connected to yeah. childhood oh, so and stuff when, like when that. I, when I was standing there looking at the actual knucklehead, I felt exactly like I did when I was a kid and I watched that TV show. So all the years just went away. It was great. 
You remember the first time that you watched that show? or Well, not the first time, yeah. but it was weird because it didn't look like I remembered it, but Trish told me it's because I, I saw it on a black and white screen like this big. It, yeah. it, it, it looked different. Knucklehead looked dark. His skin was darker and his hair was different. Yeah, because I had only seen it in black and white television. You know, you ever hear what Paul Winchell did on the side when he wasn't doing Didn't Ventura? he work on an artificial heart He invented or the artificial heart. How diverse is that? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> well, How do you make that jump? Well, look at you. You were out snorting coke. So yeah. each of you. Yeah, but would, <laughs> would you trust an, an artificial valve from a guy who has a puppet? Yeah. The you valve would? was going like this. Hey, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make blood flow. You're flatlining, <laughs> you fat fuck. Yeah. <laughs> really? Um, I got to I got to tell you it's been amazing to sit here and talk to you man and oh, man, thank you. I'm glad I made it into the top 100. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We said we go we're not going to go past 70. <laughs> really? With that uh, oh, Bonato, yeah. Okay. Uh, but we, you and I have been talking about doing this for a long time and the stories are amazing man and uh, I know it doesn't mean a lot to you but the fact that other funny people think that you're funny i hope you let that in dude because Thanks. you're you're an amazing performer Thanks, and thank you so much for being here Otto, everybody. Thanks. 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 thanks for your time thank you. Thank you.